best thing about being a member of CIR is being part of a community of ADR practitioners where one gains access to professional development opportunities through seminars, workshops, and accreditation courses, as well as access to networking opportunities through conferences and social events. The courses that I've taken through the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators have all been uh, led by very senior practitioners. So also as a senior practitioner, it gives me an awful lot of opportunity to learn more, much more than sitting in a classroom and listening to someone speak. Well, I'd recommend um, the CIR training because it's very thorough. Uh, it's recognised as a gold standard and so having the qualifications will help you in your career. First of all, one of the benefits of being an associate at Chartered Institute of Arbitrators is an opportunity to visit events and conferences on, on, on highly interesting topics. Uh, you are not only engaged in discussions, but also you receive plenty of networking opportunities. Not only was I able to attend events with leading practitioners and scholars in the field of international arbitration, but also CR allowed me to meet other students from all over the world with similar interests and thus develop further networking and professional skills. Welcome to everyone joining us around the world for the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators CIARB's annual Alexandra Lecture, which will shortly be delivered by Wendy Miles, QC FCIARB. My name is Catherine Dixon and I'm CIARB's Director General. I also will take this opportunity to warmly welcome Wendy, who's joining us from COP26, and CIARB's President Anne Ryan Robertson, who's joining us from Texas. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping issues. You can explore the Alexandra Lecture virtual platform using the navigation bar on the top. And please make sure you check out the resources page to learn more about CIARP. During the session, please use the chat function on the right side of your screen for comments on the lecture and to post questions to Wendy. To start the discussion, perhaps you'll tell us what, where you're joining from and what you've done in the past year to support the transition to a net zero world. If you're struggling with every, anything, please use the help widget, which is at the bottom of the screen. We're recording the session and we'll publish it on our YouTube channel in the next few days. A massive thank you to our sponsors, our main sponsor, JAMS, our media partners, Mediators Beyond Borders, Careers in Arbitration, Transnational Dispute Management, and the Swiss Arbitration Association. And Ryan Robertson, who is a chartered arbitrator, FCR and CIARB's president, will be making the closing remarks and putting your questions to Wendy at the end of the lecture. By way of introduction, Anne is an arbitrator and advocate in a wide variety of complex business disputes across a number of industries and is recognized as an expert in arbitration by the Global Arbitration Review, Who's Who in Arbitration, and the Best Lawyers in America International Arbitration Governmental Specialty as well as holding many of her accolades. And thank you for joining us and for being such a great president. As many of you know, I joined CIARB in 2020, having just broken the world record for cycling around the world on a tandem. During my trip, I saw firsthand the impact of climate change, including a heat wave in Europe, an extended monsoon in India and Southeast Asia, where thousands of people lost their homes because of flooding, and I experienced horrendous bushfires which swept across Australia, only avoiding them by traveling through an area of drought where it hadn't rained for three years. Before I set off, I worried about falling off my bike and getting ill. Neither of these things stopped me, but climate change very nearly did. And if we don't act now, 
and start taking personal and collective responsibility, it will stop us all. We're facing a man-made disaster of global scale. It's all our responsibility to do everything we can to create a planet that provides not only a home just for us, but for all life on Earth. This year's Alexandra lecture asks whether international arbitration can rise to the challenge of climate change. Wendy will explore the role that international arbitration can play in supporting global aims to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Wendy will consider the advantages of international arbitration that uniquely position it to play a key role in supporting climate change objectives, how international arbitration can facilitate systemic transition across key global systems to achieve meaningful change, and the need for greater participation and understanding of science in arbitral process, the consequences of rapidly developing policy and climate change law for international arbitration. As the global focus intensifies on climate change, now is the time for interna international arbitration to rise to the challenge. I'm proud to lead CIAB as a mediator and lawyer, as I, as I do believe that ADR can provide a solution to help us effectively resolve disputes arising from climate change and enable us to work towards a fairer future. CIAB is committed to promoting the benefits of ADR and being an expert voice of ADR and supporting our members with world-class training and thereby raising professional standards. I know that our members are up for the challenges posed by climate change and CIAB will be there to support them. It now gives me immense pleasure to introduce Wendy Miles, QC FCIAB. To many of us, Wendy needs little introduction. Wendy is a specialist in international arbitration and dispute resolution with a focus on private and public international law. With over 25 years experience, Wendy has advised on international law matters and conducted arbitrations under all major institutions at NADOC. She advises a wide range of multinationals, including corporate, sovereign states, and state entities and multilateral state organizations. In the field of climate change and finance, Wendy acts as a a global coordinating council to various major corporates and climate change, transition, disclosure reporting, compliance and investment. Wendy regularly advises investors and states in respect of climate related physical transition and litigation risk. She works with several states in relation to climate transition regulatory structures to mobilize finance and formulate climate investment policy. She also works closely with the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, and has represented it at the Conference of the Parties on Climate since 2015. Wendy's lecture title is International Arbitration and Sustainability Investment, Facilitator or Foe. It could not be more pertinent given the changing world we find ourselves in. Welcome, Wendy, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us this evening live from COP26. Wendy. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to CIRB for this opportunity. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, lords, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you again for this opportunity and for the platform to speak to you on the subject of ADR, sustainability and climate change. And I especially thank you for permitting me to do so remotely from the COP26 in Glasgow at a time when I know that our community is anxious to resume in-person interaction wherever possible. So the topic, as Catherine said, is international arbitration and sustainable investment facilitator or foe. Let's first remind ourselves that international arbitration is an inanimate object. As such, it can neither be friend nor foe. So the short answer to the question posed is neither. The longer answer is that international arbitration is a tool. And as such, it can play a critical role in helping to achieve or indeed to hinder the achievement of global climate change mitigation, adaptation and resilience objectives and their financing in accordance with the goals of the 2015 Paris Agreement. Now, any tool can be used in different ways. A hammer is a tool that can maim or a tool that can build a home. A pen is a tool that can write hate speech or a tool that can drive the Paris Agreement, draft the Paris Agreement rulebook and the COP26 cover decision 
as is happening right now, just down the road from where I am. It's how the tool is used that determines its effect, its power, and its influence. And it's how it's used that determines whether it helps or harms. How it is used depends on the user. It depends on her values and her understanding of the effect intended or unintended of her tool, in this case, on the achievement of the Paris Gold. So I want to take this Alexander Lecture as an opportunity to convey to you all the power that we hold as users of the tool of international arbitration when it comes to achieving these non-negotiable Paris goals, because not achieving them is simply not an option. So in order to do that, I feel I first need to communicate to you exactly what is at stake this week in Glasgow, this November, and at this critical moment for our existence on our planet. And I have to say it's with some trepidation that I do so. Because on the few occasions in the last few weeks that I've given voice to these thoughts, one businessman of a certain age labeled me a morning star reader. I, had, I confess I had to Google what that meant. And another told me I just had to learn to be less pessimistic. Look, I know this is hard to listen to, but I also know that the alternative of burying our collective head in the sand is not a viable strategy. So I speak to you tonight, this afternoon, this morning, as a member of your community, of this international arbitration community for the past 25 years. And I ask you, please, to hear me out. On community, as many of you know, I left New Zealand, my birth country, in my 20s. For the past quarter of a century, the UK has been my home and the world of arbitration has been my community. I've worked with, been mentored by, mentored, appeared against, appeared before, appeared with and had, have, had appear before me. Some of the greatest minds of international arbitration of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. I've served on our institutions 20 years on the ICC Commission, almost a decade on the ICC Court, over 20 years a member of this institution, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, six years a trustee and a term as chair of its board of trustees, and listened avidly to many of these Alexander lectures presented by truly great jurists and leaders in the field of arbitration. As I speak to you, you as the community of most of my adult life, most of my working life, I'm going to be brutally honest. I could just talk to you about decarbonization and about tr transition and opportun opportunism when it comes to both commercial contracts and resolution of their disputes. I could also talk about investment protection and investor state dispute proliferation in this brave new world of mitigation and adaptation and inevitable change in regulation by states. I could even talk to you about greening arbitration. And I will touch on each of these because I happen to think they all do matter. But I also want to talk to you about how deeply concerned, worried, and frankly frightened I am for our future. And as we move forward from this COP26, how we choose to utilize the international arbitration tools at our disposal is going to have a real and direct impact on that future. Now, some of you might be aware that I gave a keynote here in Scotland this morning to the Scottish Arbitration Association called, We Need to Talk About Climate Change. And I used a quote from the mother in the harrowing book by Lionel Shriver of a similar title as my subheading. And that's this, what we talk about is what we think about, is what our lives are about. And I chose that because I believe if we first grapple with the harrowing reality of climate change and what it means for every aspect of our lives and work, only then, can we start to think about what each and every one of us needs to be doing to tackle it? And these in turn will become what our lives and indeed our work are about. So no doubt you're reading or watching the news and seeing announcements emerging from the Scottish Exhibition Centre here in Glasgow each day. 
Our UK government likes its pithy and positive sound bites. And today I've been wearing my cop mask with its logo, let's do net zero. But there is no positive soundbite for the fact that our world is on the precipice of a rapid and unprecedented period of change. And the speed and the depth of that change, for that, we only have ourselves to blame. You see, we've had our climate diagnosis for quite some time. We've also had a cure, but we were too caught up in our own comfortable lives and work and economic models of success to make the required changes to treat the problem and administer the cure. And now we're too late to prevent the consequences of the harm we have already caused. Our climate is, I'm afraid, terminally ill. And that climate is our everything. Biodiversity is in free fall and emissions continue to rise despite years of warning over a century of warnings from the scientific community that this must stop to avoid catastrophic climate change. In this, my fifth COP, I've never before been struck by the sense of desperation and yes, grief that envelops these talks and the actions on the fringes of the negotiations. This is the COP where the message appears to have come home in the most powerful manner we are destroying the conditions required to sustain human life on this planet, as well as the lives of millions of other species. We know it, we know how to stop it, and yet we continue to do it. So it feels, it feels at this COP as though we have now entered end game. This is our final play. And the moves we make from this moment will determine our future and that of our children and their children. So if you hear the youth in the streets expressing visceral anger, despair, and deep, deep frustration, this is why. Their pain, their pain's real. And because they're not yet caught up in the mortgage, the school fees, the pension plan, the retirement, the holiday, the new car, the new house, the new job, the new partnership, the new case, the new client, all those things in our hamster wheel of life, they actually have clearer vision. And the future affects them so, so much more than it will affect most of us. As at today, we're on track for 2.7 degrees Celsius warming above pre-industrial levels by the mid-century, mid-21st century. Right now, we're already at 1.2 degrees above those levels. So we only have 0.3 of a degree to go before we exceed the target that scientists continue to warn us not to succeed by the middle of this century. 0.3 degree of a degree. Pledges from Glasgow so far get us to 1.9 degrees. And we had some very, very positive announcements from the US and China yesterday. But the actual policies currently in place only get us to 2.4 degrees. And we've proven year upon year that we're not meeting the targets we're setting. So an announcement from Glasgow this week that the world has in fact committed to something closer to 1.5 degrees will be wonderful. And as I said, the US and China announcement yesterday was well received. So too was an announcement this morning, and these are all available on the UNFCCC press site, by 12 countries who are founding members of what those countries call, rather frighteningly to an energy lawyer my, like myself, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. It's chaired by Denmark, a producing country, and Costa Rica. And the alliance includes France and New Zealand, among others, as members. Those countries are committing now, today, this week, to phase out coal in the first instance, and in some cases, to phase out all fossil fuel production, or at least subsidies. But saying you will do something and actually doing it are two very different things. In order to meet those pledges, and there have been some big pledges made over the last two weeks, in order to meet them, in order to implement them, 
everything must change. And that change is going to be really, really difficult. It's going to involve a lot of personal and professional decisions that are much more challenging than deciding whether or not to fly to an arbitration conference. The difference between 1.5 and 2.4 sounds small, but it's the difference between billions of people's homes and territories remaining habitable. Billions of displaced people who will need somewhere to go. And even in our more protected developed countries, this heat rise will cause loss of life, sea level rise, flooding, erosion, and storms will call, cause loss of homes, property, and lives. And all of this is going to cause mass interruption to supply chain and food supply. And we already know what a pandemic can do, one pandemic. We're not going to stay below 1.5 degrees. It pains me to speak those words out loud because I think of myself as an advocate for net zero by 2050 or earlier, the greenhouse gas emissions level required to keep us below 1.5 degrees warming by the middle of this century. I've spent years working with my clients to understand and learn with them what this means and how they can achieve it. But net zero by 2050 requires a 50% reduction in today's global emissions by 2030. That is in, within the next eight years. I will be 58 then, and I hope still doing the same job. My sons will be in their 20s. This is not a next century, never, never timeline. This is right now. To achieve that 50% reduction by 2030, in order to reach net zero by 2050, everything is going to change in the next eight years. Just imagine the transformative level of change required to our national laws and regulation and to our system of international trade and investment. The change that is required to transition our entire global energy system, industrial system, manufacturing and supply chain, the infrastructure system, transport, land, sea and air, and land use how we get our food. The level of transformative change required in eight short years may seem unfathomable to us this evening, but not necessarily so to our predecessors in this great institution, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and perhaps not to the founder and namesake of this evening's lecture, Mr. John Russell Willis Alexander. You see, John Alexander, who established this Alexander Lecture in the 70s, also lived through a transformative global transition and arguably more than one. He was born in 1897. He was born in an age when regional arbitration was already commonly used by European merchants and trade associations to settle commercial disputes. According to the author of an excellent article and book entitled The Three Ages of International Arbitration, Mikhail Shinazi, this was especially true of England, which had become the dominant world economic power during the Industrial Revolution. Mr. Shinazi says, as the volume of trade increased, so too did disputes between buyers and sellers. Arbitration committees were quickly set up within the cotton, corn and coffee trade associations, <coughs> to name but a few, in Liverpool and London. The London Corn Trade Association, founded in 1878, was to play a particularly important role, arguably acting as the benchmark model that was emulated by other professions in the following years. So it was these trade associations that spread and became the standard, <coughs> excuse me, of course, we should add to that the 1891 establishment of the City of London Chamber of Arbitration, sitting at Guildhall in the city at the time and comprising of members of the London Chamber and of the City Corporation. It was, of course, renamed the London Court of Arbitration in 1902 and relocated to the London Chamber of Commerce in 1905. By the way, Mr. Shinazi's work is based on his science poll PhD thesis and was supervised by the late great Dr. Emmanuel Giard, meaning high praise indeed for London and the UK's role in modern arbitration. So back to John Alexander, 
two years after he was born in 1889, the first formal international arbitration body, the Permanent Court of Arbitration was formed. It was established by the first Hague Peace Conference under Articles 20 to 29 of the 1899 Hague Convention for the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes. And it was formed in an attempt to stave off conflict that was likely to be met otherwise by gunboat diplomacy. It's that period in the late 19th century that Mr. Uh, Shinazi identified the two main groups driving the growth of international arbitration as on the one hand, merchants and trade associations, and on the other hand, the diplomats and statesmen who gathered at diplomatic conferences with the hope of settling disputes peacefully instead of resor resorting to war. This was the world John Alexander grew up in, one of merchants and statesmen working to de develop and ultimately to institutionalize our modern international arbitration system through which to resolve commercial investment and geopolitical disputes. He was just 17 when statecraft failed and World War II broke out in 1914. When World War I ended, oh, sorry, when World War I broke out in 1914, when World War I ended, he was 21. That four year period of World War I reshaped Europe and the global North and set in play the precursor to our modern system of global governance of finance. All that in just half the time that we now have to halve our global greenhouse gas emissions. Great change is possible in the period of time available once we accept we have no alternative. During the interwar period, John Alexander was in his 20s and 30s, and he continued to witness transformative events in global governance and trade and investment. Already a member by then of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, it was from within this very community that he witnessed the 1919 Treaty of Versailles, the 1919 founding of the International Chamber of Commerce, which was founded in the aftermath of the First World War when no world system of rules governed trade, investment, finance, or commercial relations. And rather than waiting for governments to fill the vacuum, the ICC's founders acted on their conviction that private sector is best qualified to set global standards for business. They called themselves the Merchants of Peace. 1920 was the first meeting of the League of Nations. The US was notably absent the Senate having voted against, not unlike COP25, the last UN climate summit in Madrid 2019. 1921, the Washington Conference, 22, Mussolini, 1923, the ICC Court of Arbitration was formed initially to deal with those post-World War I reparation claims. Then in 1932, the final League of Nations Disarmament Conference, 1938, the Munich Pact, 1939, the Spanish Civil War ended, and inevitably, September 1939, Britain and France declared war on Germany. These were all some transformative events. The year that World War II began, John Alexander turned 42. He was already a 10-year veteran member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators when the UK, Europe, and the world entered a new six-year period of unprecedented turmoil and change in modern times. We know an awful lot can change in just six years. It was almost 50 when the world war ended. And a city lawyer at that time would have been approaching retirement age, not John Alexander, he was to become the president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Now, 1945 is what Mr. Shinazi calls his second age of international arbitration, the age of institutionalization. And that ultimately was to give way to the third age, the age of autonomy. And autonomy means the international arbitration system was becoming self-contained and self-governing. But we're still in the mid 20th century here at a time when John Alexander was bearing witness to the global North attribution of World War II to its failure to have dealt with the economic problems following World War I. 
Now, hindsight, of course, is a powerful thing. And faced with the fallout of World War II, faced with the global economic instability of the time, the small cluster of then global powers established the Bretton Woods systems of global monetary management. The system that established modern rules for commercial and financial relations between the US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, and Japan. Now that Bretton Woods system of rules, institutions, and procedures regulated the international monetary system and it formed the IMF and the World Bank. And although the pegging of that Brent Bretton Woods system to the US dollar was abandoned in 1971, those years of post-war reconstruction formed our modern international economic trade and investment systems, institutions, and norms. The Bretton Woods system prioritized economic stability and political peace through an international cooperation to regulate currencies in order to maintain, maintain fixed exchange rates between countries. And that was to facilitate international trade. And this became uh, the foundation of the post-World War II free trade world, one that was uh, signaled by lower tariffs and among other things, a balancing of trade through these fixed exchange rates that favor our modern capitalist system. The objective, to reduce barriers to trade and to increase capital flows. This was the invention of central banking, fiscal stabilization, and an unprecedented opening of trade barriers and the beginning of an extraordinary period of exponential economic growth. The central economic system would overlay the then existing system of international trade and investment and emerging mercantile law norms that were developing in our field as implemented through international commercial arbitration and awards. Now, Bretton Woods World Bank ultimately, some two decades later, gave us the ICSID Convention and ICSID itself heralding a proliferation of bilateral investment treaties. That post-World War II aftermath also brought us the UN as the successor to the League of Nations. Its establishment instrument, the UN Charter, established the organization's objectives as maintaining international peace and security, protecting human rights, delivering humanitarian aid, promoting economic and social development, and upholding international law. That coupled with the World Bank and other regional development banks heralded a period of investment by the global north into developing countries that was unsustainable, but would reinforce a period of global peace and security. Not long after its formation, the UN gave us the New York Convention on the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards. And in the middle of all of these transformative changes, our John Alexander in 1952 was appointed president of this institute. Imagine the level of scholarly debate about Bretton Woods, the Marshall Plan, the UN Charter, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the New York Convention, all heralding unprecedented change to the world of investment, trade, and the law of the merchant or commercial law. I would have loved to have been in those rooms, but I probably wouldn't have been permitted entry. Now, those game-changing instruments of the mid-20th century made no mention of sustainability and no mention of the environment. And they certainly made no mention of the climate. That's despite the Swedish scientist Svant Anhas having discovered feedback loops that could accelerate climate change back in 1896, the year before John Alexander was born. Think about that. We've known about climate change for over a century. For John Alexander's entire life, and through the five decades since his death. And for some of those decades, a good sum of those decades, we've also known the cure. But because we failed to act upon that knowledge, despite the science becoming clearer and clearer, we now find ourselves with eight years to reduce our emissions by half. But eight years is twice as long as the duration of the First, first World War. Eight years is two years longer than the duration of the Second World War. Eight years is 127 years less than the amount of time we've known about this problem, 
And for 135 years, we've traveled the road of economic development and growth with no regard for how development of the needs of the present generation has compromised the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That is with no regard for sustainable development. So this 2021st year AD, as negotiations wind down in Glasgow, we stand at a fork in the road. I wonder what John Alexander would have said if he stood with us now at this juncture. I would hope he would point out to us that major transformative events can occur and have occurred in a few short years, and certainly less than eight. He's witnessed that life does go on and that we can and we will adjust to change, however transformative. We as individuals, communities, professionals, and members of the community of arbitration will all adjust. I like to think he'd also tell us that we can have courage as individuals, a community and society to step forward and embrace the choice that lies in the road ahead. Robert Frost, in his 2015 poem, The Road Not Taken, speaks of such steps. He says, and you all will know the words, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other, as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. We've long stood and looked down the road of economic growth and development at all cost. We need to take the other road and step forward into a sustainable future, not just for ourselves, but for those who follow us. The road taken in Glasgow rests in the hands of state negotiators, policy makers and legislators. We hope it remains firmly on the road to rapid decarbonisation because that's really the only pathway that will not compromise the ability of future generations, our children and their children, to be able to meet their needs in the future. Certainly the youth have been here tirelessly for the last two weeks, reminding those government negotiators that this is their future at stake, not ours. But the road we take as individuals and professionals and as a community that offers the world tools and services for international dispute resolution, that's up to us. And it's this road that I want to map for you for the remainder of this talk. I'll explore how we might use our international dispute resolution tools to help achieve Paris Agreement goals of climate change mitigation, adaptation and resilience. What we do next is a choice. But it's also not a choice, because if we don't find a way to utilize all the tools in our collective arsenal to work together to achieve the Paris Agreement goals, we're going to find ourselves in a place of global conflict, violence and disputes that will make the two world wars of John Alexander's lifetime seem minor. So whilst our tools were developed in part by diplomats and statesmen who gathered at diplomatic conferences with the hope of settling disputes peacefully instead of resorting to war, the hope is that if we commercial dispute resolution lawyers use these tools wide, wisely in the commercial investment context, then perhaps we won't need to deploy them for peacekeeping in response to this problem. So our road ahead, grassy and wanting wear, looks like this. First, our tools are already utilized in every aspect of the front line of implementation of those energy, infrastructure, industry, transport and land use projects that form the architecture of the existing high emitting system that we're transitioning out of. Some of those investment agreements and contracts are going to need, a lot of those investment agreements and contracts are going to need to be renegotiated, some of them terminated, in order for the many states and corporates who have made net zero pledges here in Glasgow and leading up to Glasgow to implement those pledges in the real economy. 
Pledges by the finance sector, in particular, the private finance sector, are going to have a resonating effect <coughs> throughout the investment community. Banks, asset owners, asset managers have committed to aligning their investment debt and equity with net zero. Now we're already seeing some successful enforcement claims against financial institutions and national courts where those pledges are not followed through or not followed through quickly enough. And one example is the McVeigh case in Australia against retail employees superannuation trust. That case settled before a decision, but the settlement led to a change in standards of climate change risk management and disclosure and investment across the superannuation sector in Australia. Standard setters, meanwhile, are working also to help hold those financial institutions' feet to the fire, as well as the companies they fund. <coughs> During this Glasgow COP, the IFRS announced the formation of a new standards board, the International Sustainability Standards Board, and that is developing new comprehensive global baselines for high quality sustainability disclosure standards. What this means is that financial reporting standards will be required to include climate and sustainability reporting. And those financing corporate activity will be able to see precisely what they're funding and make the decision whether or not they wish to continue to fund that based on whether or not it aligns with their own net zero commitments. New Zealand announced last week that it has uh, enacted its mandatory climate, finance, climate um, risk reporting and disclosure rules. The UK has announced that it is about to make those rules mandatory in its law and the EU is soon to follow. This is the direction of travel. Much of the real economy investment that these financial institutions are funding it's the stuff that we see every day in our cases. This rapid and deep transition away from our existing high emitting infrastructure and architecture is going to create an awful lot of uncertainty. And we all know that uncertainty creates disputes. Now at the same time, transition requires somewhere else for that money to go. Public and private sector finance is working hard to create new bankable investments. And many of those are in new technologies and or new and emerging markets. These are by definition high risk and often lower yield than investors are accustomed to. Higher risk and lower yield might be our inevitable future, but it's going to take some getting used to. And we're going to see a lot of adjusting to different damages and loss models, models as we muddle our way through it all. As lawyers, we have a lot, to, lot of work to do, but so too do damages experts. State and financial institution pledges, pledges to net zero by 2050, which require that 50% reduction by 2030. Those that have emerged from Glasgow have been unprecedented in, in their level and ambition. And the private finance pledges have been associated with the sum of $130 trillion. Now there's a fair bit of double counting in that sum, but it is still tens of trillions that are to be reallocated um, to low carbon activity. But those pledges won't be met until and unless investment proceeds in a very different way going forward. So to achieve the Paris goals, the systems that require transition, as I say, are energy, infrastructure, industry, and land use. And all four of those systems need to move from high carbon emitting activity to net zero by 2050 or earlier, 50% reduction within eight years. And as I say, that's going to require an enormous investment in the new architecture and massive winding down of the existing architecture, all of which is bound up in contracts and commitments, and more often than not, coupled with arbitration agreements. Many of these are underwritten by separate contracts of insurance guarantees, <coughs> share purchase agreements, shareholders agreements, investment protection agreements, 
and legal other legal instruments containing yet more arbitration agreements. So in order to achieve transition and align international arbitration awards with the Paris goals, International Arbitration Council need to work with our clients, state and corporates, to ensure that the relevant arguments are put to the tribunals. Ideally, both sides' arguments would ultimately align with the Paris goals, and ideally the tribunal would feel able to ask questions and direct proceedings in a manner, manner that requires that to happen. So let's take, for example, a claim arising out of a state's early termination of a coal-fired power plant. The state may have introduced new legislation or regulation to enforce its nationally determined contribution, its strategic plan for net zero under the Paris Agreement. And it may have introduced um, policy to phase out coal by 2030. This is happening right here this week. Um, 40 countries last week pledged to phase out coal here in Glasgow. So this is happening, this is not a hypothetical. The current draft cover decision to COP, this is one of the main instruments that comes out of this COP. The current draft, unless one came out in the last couple of hours when I wasn't looking, includes language to that effect in relation to all state parties. It says that parties commit to phasing out coal and also to phasing out fossil fuel, other fossil fuel subsidies. Now, once fossil fuel subsidies are phased out, renewable energy for electricity, for power, is likely to be more economically viable than oil or gas in most circumstances. Expect further phase out to follow as states shore up energy security with alternatives. This won't just be gas. Expect to see nuclear and green hydrogen, for instance. So as our states phase out coal and phase out fossil fuel subsidies, um, or as our, as our state in our example phases out coal in particular, it may seek to terminate a public-private partnership in accordance with its new law that changes that coal regulation. That new law may render that public-private partnership contract void or terminable under its terms, but it also might not. There could be a stabilization provision in that agreement, or perhaps there might be a parallel investment treaty protecting the investment from changes in the operating environment that are inconsistent with the legitimate expectations of the parties as they existed at the time of the initial investment. So pursuant to an arbitration agreement, either in that contract or the treaty, the state's action that it takes to meet its Paris commitments through its legislation and regulation may well fall to our community, to us as arbitrators, for determination. And our decisions as arbitrators, our decisions as counsel as to what arguments to run and how to run them, and our experts' decisions as to how they model, for example, the value of coal beyond 2030, they're all matters within our control. And these decisions will have a decisive effect on whether or not we, as a global community, achieve the goals of Paris. You see, if this community continues to utilize its dispute resolution tools, independent of or in ignorance of what is happening in the industries and sectors we serve, we will hinder a global movement to transition and to correct our path. So I'm not asking you, the arbitration community, to do anything radical here, at least not yet. I'm asking you simply to be aware of the transition and be aware that the cases you argue, opine on and decide matter to the success of that transition. They're at the front line of it and your work will influence its speed and influence its success. So please don't put climate change and the Paris goals out of your mind when the COP circus packs up at the end of this week and makes its way to Egypt for COP27 at the end of 2022. Please stay on top of the subject and the effect of your work and how you use your dispute resolution tools day to day in the cases you're dealing with right now. It's day to day use of our tools in a responsible matter. But secondly, outside the day-to-day case-by-case um, context, systemic change is required. And that's a bit more than case-to-case -case awareness of and factoring in climate change goals. 
our system of international arbitration, the legal, procedural, and institutional structure within which we operate our tools is somewhat harmonized and homogenous. We know one another, we work on trust and familiarity, and we rely on our expertise developed over years of using our tools in a particular way. Recall this system, our modern system, represents Shinazi's third age of arbitration, what he calls the age of autonomy, the age where our system becomes its own self-governing set of rules and norms and precedent. And the French have been the primary proponents of this concept of the age of autonomy. The problem with creating an autonomous and self-supporting system of international arbitration is that it risks losing the flexibility that lies at the very heart of the toolkit of ADR mechanisms at our disposal. You may have already heard of the law of the instrument. The hammer will treat everything as a nail. International arbitration, as it has evolved over the years, risks treating every case as a dispute requiring the same lengthy adversarial process culminating in a final and binding award. But climate change disputes will be so much more complex, interconnected and systemic than that. And they will require both a more systemic and also more flexible approach. The disputes that lie ahead of us in transition to net zero are going to involve more imagination than that. Not every case is going to be a nail. The ICC climate change related disputes and ADR and arbitration report considers this and points out that climate change related disputes often require non-lawyer expertise and multi-tiered dispute resolution processes, including for example, dispute advisory boards in place in situ during entire project wind downs or wind ups of low carbon new untested activity. What the report did not discuss at any length was the role of <coughs> truly alternative dispute resolution, at least to us and the users of our modern system. So for example, indigenous peoples traditional conciliation practices and solutions are going to need to be integrated with our system of dispute resolution when the investments we're dealing with encroach directly upon their lands, territories and natural resources in order to preserve the necessary access and social license to those projects and investments. Now, a senior, when I was discussing this with a senior development bank official earlier this week, she told me about resettling spirits on the River Nile in order for an investment project to proceed. These are the sorts of challenges that we'll face and need to resolve in order to access these lands, resources and territories that are essential for transition to proceed and for it to proceed in a just manner. So a huge and deeply contentious aspect of climate change mitigation involves carbon offsets and carbon trading. And 5% of the world's population that of the indigenous peoples, they're stewards to 80% of the world's ecosystem and biodiversity. And for us to reach our climate transition goals, if we're going to use ups, offsets, requires us to work with those indigenous peoples and learn how to do so on their terms and not just on ours. So these voices, the indigenous people's voices, are a real drumbeat here at COP in the negotiating rooms and in the corridors. The tens of thousands of people who marched on the streets in Glasgow on Saturday, they were mostly youth and indigenous peoples. And if you listen to them, they are imploring us to listen and to let them tell us how to steward their lands and resources because they've protected those resources for future generations for thousands of years. And the harm we've caused, we've done it in just 70. So in the process of resolving disputes, we need to be able to give voice, platform, and sounding to all of those voices. And we have some precedent of this, although it's not perfect. The Permanent Court of Arbitration, ABA arbitration in two, 2009, arose out of the Sudan Comprehensive Peace Agreement. And that determined the lands of the nine Nok Dinka chieftains as at 1905. Now, council, as council for the Southern Sudanese, I remind you that the dispute was determined by five senior jurists, two from the US, two from Europe, and one from Jordan, none from Africa. 
counsel teams, similarly were Anglo-European lawyers in their entirety. And again, no one from Africa. None of the tribunal was a woman. And the only um, women that were part of the senior counsel team and arguing in the case was only one on each side and senior teams dominated by men. So we need those voices, we need the diverse voices and we need the represented people's voices in these disputes. So thirdly, we also need to start to think more creatively about the overlaps and interlinkages between our evolving system of Lex Mercatoria and other legal systems, including public international law and national court jurisprudence. Because climate change cases are being decided every week in national and regional courts. And uh, claims are being brought also in international fora. And consequently, a body of climate law is rapidly building. And that law is relevant to the cases we're working on and deciding. So we need to be aware of this growing body of jurisprudence and ensure that our work and decision properly reflect it where applicable. If not, I suspect it will not be too long before we start to see New York Convention challenges against awards that the challenging party claims are inconsistent with the enforcing states international or international um, public policy on climate change. So challenges under Article 5.2 of the New York Convention. We haven't seen it yet, but it's almost certainly one direction of travel. And with so many of the cases that we see in international commercial arbitration in these areas of transition involving public-private partnerships, at least somewhere in the project, or use of natural resources or territory, this is likely to happen, I would hazard, sooner rather than later. And especially so in light of the massively ramped up commitments coming out of Glasgow this week. So investment treaty arbitration is an even more obvious field for the integration of this emerging body of climate change law from other fora. Already, most of the cases under the Energy Charter Treaty relate to renewable investments and or changes in national regulation in response to the state's changing climate policy. Cases under NAFTA include renewables, forests and offsets and emissions trading schemes. All of these investments are areas that are in the front line of implementation of the Paris Agreement and the real economy. And so far as there is, is an emerging body of climate change law that is applicable in any of those cases, it should be reflected in council's arguments and in the award outcomes. So fourthly, and I'm getting more radical as I go. According to the high level climate champion for the UNFCCC, Nigel Topping, we need to push the boundaries even more and start to think about how we replumb, replumb the entire system of investment, financing, and the law. This isn't just in terms of process and procedure, but also substantively. This is what I find, fondly think of as the experimental drugs not to alter our minds, but to alter our investment and governance systems. One thing that's really struck me in the past few weeks, as I've said, is the drumbeat of indigenous peoples at COP. They have their own caucus in these negotiations and their own platform for discussions. And they're acutely aware of the natural resources that we need for our nature-based carbon offsets and solutions acutely aware of the natural resources from which we need to mine those new minerals and metals that are required to manufacture the millions of wind farms and tens of millions of photovoltaic panels for solar farms, as well as the uranium to operate the small modular reactors, the copper, the lithium, and, and various other metals and minerals and also acutely aware of the territory that they control over which we need to construct our new alternative infrastructure for travel, for production, food production, and transportation. And all of that is in their territories and subject to indigenous property rights and protections under international law, subject to those human rights protections that um, came out of the Second World War. So yet these communities are not actually, at least not what I hear, are not holding the developed 
expect the world to ransom. All they're asking is that we listen to them and allow them to maintain stewardship as they've done for thousands of years while we take what we need in a sustainable manner and without causing harm. It really shouldn't be too much to ask, but it does require us to learn new things, traditional methods of sustainable development and protection of the environment. Now, I can't tell you how this will play out or whether or not our developed world view of economic growth can ever give way to a structure that values people and planet at least as much as profit, if not more. But I hope it can, and I especially hope that when we find ourselves involved in cases that put these non-pecuniary values before us as decision makers, that we're able to give them the same respect that we give to income and profit loss. Our forefathers have given us the tools for this already. The New York Convention, whilst containing a commercial exception, provides that as a non-mandatory opt-in provision. So a New York Convention award dealing with non-commercial issues and relief is enforceable in those countries that did not opt in to the commercial exception. And the United Kingdom is one of those countries. So our London seat is secure in this brave new world. Finally, we need to step up as a community, but also as individuals. Let's not just switch off and go home and try not to think about all of this because it's just too hard and too depressing. If COVID-19 has taught us nothing else, it's taught us that the human mind is extraordinarily adaptable. We can learn to accept a world of masks, of daily testing, of social distancing, of lockdown in our communities and lives, learning and working through a small series of rectangular boxes. Let's act with courage and look our future in the eye, acknowledge our reality and respond accordingly. That's what makes us active citizens, active parents, active lawyers, active arbitrators and members of active arbitral institutions. Not activist, simply active, active and engaged. And in these tense and difficult times ahead, I invite all of you to exercise a little consideration and kindness to each other. We can't fight among ourselves over this. There's not enough time. We have to support one another and support our clients and our governments and communities in this transition. We need to support those we represent and act for and help them to implement the commitments they've made. They need us, their lawyers, to be their champions and supporters, not obstacles between them and the steps that they've already committed to take, the road that they've already chosen to travel. I'm proud to learn that the Chat Institute of Arbitrator is looking hard at what it can do to help this community develop the necessary tools to educate, capacity build and support, and to help all of us build our resilience. The path before us is pretty clear. We just need to walk down it with our eyes wide open and in full understanding of the effect of our tools and how we wield them on the goals and commitments of the global community to meet the Paris goals of climate mitigation, net zero greenhouse gases by 2050 and adaptation. Robert Frost's final stanza, it says, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. You may already know that Frost's poem was meant to be a gentle joke to his dear friend and fellow poet, Edward Thomas, who by all counts was a little indecisive. Ultimately, Frost's poem seems to have influences, influenced Thomas's decision to enlist to fight in World War I, where he died within two months. But Thomas's words upon taking that decision were these. It seems foolish to have loved England up until now without knowing it could perhaps be ravaged and I could and perhaps would do nothing to prevent it. Well, 
lords, ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you that our climate is right now being ravaged and there is something that each and every one of us can do to prevent it. And that could make all the difference. Thank you. Wendy, thank you very much for that thought provoking uh, lecture and needless to say it has already generated a number of questions from the audience and I urge the audience to please continue to send your questions in so that we can have an opportunity to have this expert answer them for us. And the first question that uh, I'd like to put to you is, is there a legal definition of net zero carbon, which would otherwise present the world <laughs> with a recognized term against which legal obligations can be enforced? It's, it's a really good question and, and one that's taxing <coughs> many communities, including outside the law. The answer is no, um, but there is a scientific definition. And the... Um, it's essentially the additional um, parts per million of greenhouse gases that are added um, to the atmosphere between now and 2050 in order to keep that temperature target at that level. So there's a scientific definition and it's not um, um, in dispute uh, and it's fairly easy to understand, but the challenge is how do you track um, an individual country or an individual corporate's um, sort of um, compliance with those uh, net zero targets over time. And that's difficult, but that's why these international standards are really interesting because what they're doing is creating a global standard that's not disparate and based on different national laws and national interpretations, but a global standard and accounting methodology for how corporates can report those net zero commitments. Sadly, um, there's no equivalent for states as yet. Okay, thank you. The well, next one relates to the Energy Charter Treaty. It says there has been a modernization of the ECT because the provisions are not sufficient to implement the Paris Agreement's goals. What would happen to the Energy Charter Treaty? Would the members have a consensus to have a greener ECT? So look in your, your green, your uh, future ball for that for us. So the Energy Charter Treaty gets a really bad rap. And, and you know, it, if you read it, it actually has a lot of sustainability protections built into it. So for an instrument from 1994, it was actually pretty attuned to the need for a sustainable energy system. And I don't think it was just talking about economically sustainable. Remember, 1994 was two years after the Rio conference, which was the first conference of the parties in the, in the um, climate COP process. It was also the year of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's, um, I think the drafters of the Energy Charter Treaty um, were not necessarily overlooking or ignoring the need for a sustainable energy system. Um, I just don't think council have really put the arguments that way. I think there, there um, are <coughs> Paris Agreement aligned um, ways to, to argue either for claimant or respondent under the Energy Charter Treaty. But in terms of the modernization process, as we all know, there's a, there's a long sunset clause, sunset provision I've had members of governments come up and speak to me throughout the last two weeks, mostly within Europe, who are determined to um, you know, give notice of, of withdrawal from the Energy Charter Treaty, irrespective of what happens in the broader European courts context. Um, so you know, it, it, it's firmly out of favor um, in the um, in the governments and in the, in the climate community. But I think that's unfortunate because I actually think 
like the pen and like the hammer, it is but a tool and it, it could be utilized to accelerate and facilitate investment in the uh, renewable energy and other low carbon and decarbonization um, sort of investments that we require. And you know, the main thing we need to do is move the money and the money will only move if the investors um, have some securitization uh, around that investment. And the Energy Charter Treaty and other investment treaties can provide that. So I, I worry that we're being a little um, premature in, in throwing that out. That said, it's not perfect. And if we were drafting it today, we'd draft it differently. So there are ways that, that it could be tweaked if consensus could be reached, but I'm not sure that can be achieved. Well, this leads then into the next question, which is what is the way forward towards encouraging an all-in participation in policy and decision-making? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I, I say this to myself and I say it to my sons, I think participate in, in what's happening in your local elections and in your national elections. I mean, really participate and engage and look at what governments are doing and what they're saying, um, and particularly at a local level, um, and be aware of, of what's happening around. There are um, surprisingly few lawyers in the negotiating rooms um, at COP, and there, there are lots of, um, obviously, um, external relations negotiators but surprisingly few lawyers. And you know, if your governments, what I would suggest to people is you know, make your own way to COP and offer, particularly if you come from a small state, offer to your governments to be available to them. If you have a badge and you know, most observers can get a badge if they're um, organized about it, you get access to all of the drafts and you know, these, these teams are running on such tight schedules, so little sleep, terrible food, <laughs> and not easy conditions. And at the end of two weeks, they are exhausted. You know, think about those big deals we do as lawyers. You know, this is a massive negotiating process. And if there's a lawyer with a fresh mind analyzing documents and analyzing what's changing in drafts, I think really important things can get picked up. So, so I do think our international um, um, sort of legal community could front up and, and get a bit involved. Now, governments probably won't thank me for that, having a whole bunch of us interfering, but they can ignore us. Um, but I, I think just having people on board is actually really valuable because these words are really going to matter. And watch this draft cover decision because right now it's got human rights, indigenous peoples, oceans, all sorts of really powerful protections in it, but the word on the ground is, is they probably won't survive to the final draft. And that would be a real shame. Well, let me ask you this. You used as an example, um, coal, if you'll recall. And so we have a question. What is the reaction of countries whose economies are driven by coal derived products? Can they really be stopped and risk economic collapse? So I'm not sure what the questioner means by coal derived products, but energy systems that are based on coal um, in developed countries, that is really the focus of the adaptation funds. Um, and the $100 billion you hear about of public money to try to convert those energy systems as soon as possible to an alternative. And the thing to remember about renewables is since 2017, wind and solar has been a cheaper option for building new power infrastructure, electricity infrastructure for how we work and live maybe not heavy industry, but certainly for how we work and live, um, it's been cheaper. The only thing that makes it less attractive are government subsidies uh, for, for the existing um, energy systems. So, um, so the alternatives are there and they're investable. 
um, wind and uh, solar, like good returns and are very investable right now. So I think that public money is really important to transitioning, but the private money and, you know, this, this mag I call it the 130 trillion fairy wings because, you know, the, the, the global GDP is only 70 trillion a year. So I'm not quite sure where this 130 trillion comes from, but anyway, so be it. Um, all of the money in, in the financial system needs to find a Paris aligned place to invest. So every renewable power plant, every renewable project infrastructure um, or low carbon infrastructure is going to be something that these private financial institutions are looking to invest in. And as I say, those sorts of projects are bankable. The ones that aren't bankable, are the important energy supplements that overcome issues like intermittency. So wind, solar, you know, we learned this in the UK this year, you know, there, is in, there are intermittency problems and we're not prepared um, to live with those at present. They may be our future, but right now we're not prepared to, to live with those. So we're using gas and coal as a backup, but um, green hydrogen, or small modular reactors, there's other options for backup. It's just they're not developed enough, the technology's there, but they're not developed enough to be cheap enough to be scaled up. And so those projects need to become more bankable, more investable. And with supplementing by um, public funds, development bank funds, the 100 billion that's committed by developed states and the adaptation funds, those things can become bankable, just like wind and solar have. Thank you. I'd like to change the focus just a little bit. You've spoken about the crucial role that arbitrators can play in the transition to a net zero economy. What is the role of professional institutions in properly informing, equipping, and training arbitration practitioners so that they can fully perform that role? So I think professional institutions like the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators play a really, really critical role in educating and in capacity building. But also one of the most powerful sort of um, products that the Chartered Institute puts out are its guidelines. And, you know, I'm sure we've all used them repeatedly <coughs> to answer questions that we have um, and in making arguments. And so I think, again, those guidelines, which are not mandatory, they're not binding, but they help set out um, a, a, an emerging norm of best practice. So perhaps there are questions that um, the CIR could um, suggest an arbitrator ask, a little like it sets out its guidelines for interviewing arbitrators. Um, perhaps there are questions that an arbitrator could ask um, or, or a manner in which it could raise arguments um, that could be subject to guidance. Perhaps guidance for um, younger members of teams who um, uh, sort of want to raise issues but, um, but um, are concerned about how to raise them. I mean, you know, with... <laughs> With the freedom of imagination and a few experimental drugs, you know, I think, and what I mean by experimental drugs, I'm not suggesting anyone take them. I'm, I'm just saying that we, we have a pretty um, terminal situation and, and I think we have to sort of look at um, um, sort of new ideas and solutions. So maybe guidance for younger practitioners, maybe guidance for clients on just how to start these conversations. Because I think once this started, there'll be a watershed. Well, we'll certainly take note of everything you've said because one of the issues for the Chartered Institute in the DAS, which is coming up in December, and then ongoing obviously is going to be how we as an institution can help to tackle uh, climate change. So in addition to improving the capacity of arbitrators to interpret the law in a way that's conducive to sustainable investment and to move to a net zero economic system, are substantive changes in the law itself required? And if you think so, can you specify for us? Yes. <coughs> yes, um, absolutely. And they, the, <coughs> 
sorry, this is not COVID. This is just 10 speeches this week and my, <laughs> my voice is giving up. Um, yes, so, so the model, the Grantham Institute at LSE keeps a very comprehensive, excellently organized database on the laws of the world. And it has um, judgments and decisions, but it also has legislation. And basically the, the architecture of transition legislation starts in most developed states with a climate change framework act and that's what sets the objectives and um, in a perfect world establishes a commission that sits outside the government um, and is, is, is not subject to um, um, the, the whims of the elected government <laughs> like we have here in the UK. And that, that body then will, will do a thorough research for what transition strategy is required in that country and what's needed. And then there's changes within um, sort of each of the systems requiring um, um, transition. There's changes that can be made within each of those systems framework acts. So if you have an energy act or a power act, there might be changes there. You might um, regulate more um, in relation to some power sources and, and less in relation to others. You may create um, sort of more incentives uh, for, for transport, for example, or, or implementation of charging centers. You know, very, very practical things and they all come in that legislation. Uh, buildings, infrastructure, we need to use less energy. The way we use less energy is we make our buildings more efficient and the British housing stock is not great for building efficiency. So, so shoring up the efficiency and making sure that new builds are built in a way that's much more efficient. Um, getting the system off gas uh, for heating in British homes and, and buildings. So all of that happens through those regulations and acts. Carbon pricing is a really important part of this. Um, if you put um, it's Peguvian tax, you tax the behavior that you're trying to dissuade. Um, and ideally, you try to use the revenue collected to invest in encouraging the behavior that, that you're trying to promote. So the ICC just published a, a new set of um, carbon pricing principles that set out just 10 broad level principles that are applicable in developed and developing states in relation to carbon pricing. That's important. Creating high integrity carbon markets. Now these are tricky because so many of the, um, the carbon units that are created by these markets stem from um, natural resources that are in indigenous communities, forests and green uh, carbon uh, sinks and blue carbon sinks. And so we need to be very, very careful about how we do that because we have a poor history of appropriating um, those resources for um, to be able to profit from trading carbon credits and communities being displaced, people dying um, in the way that's been done in the past under the Kyoto Agreement. So we need to, to find ways to do that with, with high integrity and all of that comes in regulation and framework, but, but not just by states, something like a high integrity carbon trading voluntary carbon market system can be done through a system of rules and contracts as it currently is with a system of dispute resolution that can exist outside of, of national legislature and national courts. So there's, there's lots, of, lots of things that we can do and are doing. The trouble is democracy is, is subject to election cycles and some of the things that need to be done, and we saw this with the, um, the, the yellow vest protests in Paris a couple of years ago, some of the things that need to be done um, can be done badly and prejudice the people who um, are most vulnerable. And in that case, it was low income workers, but even well thought out and balanced policies still cost us, you know, the, the, High em ultra high um, emission zone charge in, in London. You know, anyone who was driving a diesel car at the time, um, suddenly it's 10 pounds a day, just adding to your budget. That's a lot. So, so these things can be painful. So they are subject to democratic cycles um, and it's difficult, which is why I think it's important that we all sort of absorb <laughs> just how dire a situation we're in 
And then I think those little pains become a little more tolerable. Well, you've obviously been studying this particular issue for some time, so we can say that you are indeed an expert, but many of us are not. Uh, how science literate do you believe the arbitration community as a whole is currently, and how can we develop expertise in climate science within the profession? Any ideas? Yeah, um, it's something that really worries me, Anne. It, it really does worry me. Um, not scientifically literate enough. Um, and I think the adversarial process where we set off experts against one another um, doesn't help because it leaves an arbitrator with two experts who've been cross-examined to nothingness and not really very much to um, base her or his decision on um, at the end of the hearing cross-examination process. And I don't think that's helpful. I think we need for some core um, climate science issues. I think we need to think outside the box a bit, um, follow sort of civil law structures of more tribunal appointed scientific experts or finding a way to have an amicus brief or an agreed expert report just on the base science because you know parties you know, we take facts we take opinion and we cast it in the best possible narrative to win our case on the climate science that's not helpful it you just have to get the right information to the tribunal and I think we need to find a way to cut through that because that science shouldn't be in dispute the IPCC goes through a thorough peer-reviewed process and the science that's reported by them they don't write the science they just analyze and report on what's already out there um, it's it's pretty comprehensively peer-reviewed in a way that I don't think we can ever replicate through cross-examination so I think we need to find a way to do that perhaps more scientists on tribunals if they really do come to the core of these issues perhaps things like dispute boards with a layer of uh, scientific expert determination, like we already do in, for example, um, call or put options under share purchase agreements, we will have an expert determination of the valuation of that share, and that will be an accountant. Now, it will be subject, potentially, to an arbitration subsequently if the parties don't agree, but it, it creates that layering. So I think where net zero targets um, compliance for example sort of is wrapped up in a contract in an issue we should find a way to put um, a, a tear in the dispute for that to stay away from our adversarial process if we can but there are I and mean, one of the things that we've been trying to do um, with um, the commercial law community more broadly not just dispute resolution lawyers is develop capacity building tools with the science and very simple, straightforward videos. And I know Oxford is involved in that and Cambridge as well. And hopefully the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators soon as well. But I think there's some basics. Um, so there's 101 in the science that can be pretty easily conveyed. But these reports are coming out constantly. So we got the physical science basis report a month ago. We're going to get chapters two and three from the second and third working groups in the coming months. So, you know, we need to sort of have a way to keep on top of this. So we're all at the same baseline on the science. And, you know, lawyers, I find in our community, pretty smart people. You, know, you, you give them the material, don't ask them to read through thousands of pages of IPCC reports, and, um, and they'll pick it up pretty quick. Well, thank you very much for answering these questions. Unfortunately, we cannot reach all of the questions that were posed to uh, you today. Uh, I want to thank you, Wendy, for this informative presentation, which I will call the call to arms. And if I might, in conclusion, on behalf of the Chartered Institute, state that we recognize that the public has come to appreciate that climate change is the defining challenge of our era. And as you, Wendy, noted, much of the awareness is attributable to the tireless campaigning of the youth who continually are reminding us that their future is at stake. And climate change is indeed the biggest issue humanity has ever had to overcome. And the transition to a net zero 
carbon economy, as you rightly noted, will require unprecedented political, social, and commercial change. And it will require imagination. That we had over 1,000 people sign up for your lecture, Wendy, highlights the importance of this topic. Much has been said and written about what we as individuals can do to address climate change. Your presentation, however, brings into focus not only how the legal profession should and must adapt to contribute to net zero carbon goals, but also the challenges ahead for us as a profession. Your presentation also emphasizes the overwhelming urgency mankind faces. Eight years is indeed a short period of time. The Chartered Institute is committed to being a thought leader, an honest broker, and pioneering actor in realizing the vision of a dispute profession, which amplifies rather than hinders the transition to net zero. To that end, the Institute's visions for the profession on the issue of sustainability is a profession that embeds an appreciation of the necessity of achieving net zero across all its activities, understands the deep strategic relationship between how disputes are handled and the wider imperative of emissions reduction and takes bold and innovative steps to act as an amplifier for building a sustainable world. Our role as a professional body in promoting sustainability will be including equipping and empowering our members with the knowledge, skills, and tools they need to fully incorporate an understanding of sustainability and net zero in their work. It will also include influencing the profession, policymakers, and businesses through the development of persuasive thought leadership. And this is going to focus on innovative, practical solutions and developing tools, not hammers necessarily, that professionals can actually use. Wendy, you made reference of our uh, guidance notes and on the plans are preparation of professional practice guidance, codes of conduct, and insight papers. And finally, we hope to collaborate and convene with the partners and allies to be a force multiplier for our influence and enable the Chartered Institute to have an impact on enabling the profession to play a strategic role in reaching net zero. Your outstanding and thought provoking lecture today is the first important step the Chartered Institute will be taking in the coming months. The fundamental choice for the profession is between enabling radical transformation or blocking it. The Institute thanks you for sharing your wisdom and insight on this exceedingly important topic and thanks all of you who have joined us today. There is much to be done as we embark upon a journey down that road less traveled. As you noted, Wendy, our climate is being ravaged. Hopefully in the future years, it can be said that we did in fact make all the difference. I want to thank all of you who joined us today for the Alexander lecture. I want to thank Wendy again for her thoughts and lecture. And I want to thank the support of our sponsors with our main sponsor being JAMS and our media sponsors being Mediators Beyond Borders, Careers in Arbitration, Transnational Dispute Management, and Swiss Arbitration Association. Thank you. <laughs>